Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It's finally December, and Matt and I are back. Matt, the Flames have had a pretty good week. How are you feeling right now? Oh, looking forward to some interesting talk on Flames hockey. They had a fairly good week, and... Just excited to see this team hit 500 after the Dallas game. I think this week we're going to be talking a lot about the blue line. Oh, I agree. But let's jump into it. Before we talk about the blue line, let's go even further back on the ice. Let's talk about the goalies and the Vegas game when we go back through the week. Um, Calgary Flames played the uh, at home against the Kraken in the Sal Dome this week. And yeah. the story of this one, I think, was the e-bug, the emergency backup goaltender. Dan Vladar was in net against the Vegas Golden Knights. Not something we would have thought would have happened because Jacob Markstrom got to the arena and said he was feeling sick. The NHL rules say that uh, you cannot make a recall after 5 p.m. the day of, so the Flames could not have brought up Wolf, even though he was in town and ready to go. So Dusty Nickel was the e-bug for this one. Um, Flames ended up winning this one. Thankfully, he didn't need to put the e-bug into action. Uh, 2-1 win over the Golden Knights. And Matt, I have to ask you, do you think this was the Flames' best game of the year so far? I would have to say that um, the team rallied around uh, the goaltender, especially... Uh, one Vladar, uh, he got run a few times in the game, and uh, I think that the Flames did an excellent job of protecting him, after, especially with the Greer stepping up against uh, Carrier. Um, and uh, you yeah, know, I mean, it, it was it, what like five minutes into the game, and it already looked like he like we might have had to switch goalies. Yeah, and to his credit, Vladar I think had his best game as a Flame in this contest. I agree. Yeah. And, you know, you and I have talked for a while about Dan Vladar and asking the question, what is he? And, you know, is he a, a starter? Is he a backup? What is he as an NHLer? And I think that, um, you know, we're starting to see more this year as, as he's getting not just starts, but in this one, a very quality start. I think we're really starting to see as well that, you know what, maybe there's maybe there's more to this guy. Maybe he can take on a bigger role for either the Flames or some other team. Yeah, and, and frankly, with the, how this season has started with Jacob Markstrom playing rather effectively, um, it's helped to increase Markstrom's value. And, you know, like the default was that, well, we're stuck with Markstrom and you have to trade Vladar if you want to make room for Wolf. And with Markstrom playing well enough uh, and looking more like his normal self, uh, it lends more to the idea of maybe you can pass Markstrom off to a different team and allow Vladar the runway to see what he can do at the NHL level as a starting goaltender because he has looked excellent thus far this season. And in, especially if the team decides to move in, you know, we're not supposed to use that rebuild word here in Calgary, but if they decide to move in a young direction, I think you could definitely do that. Yeah, and... Vladar is like the right age to be the starter for a team for four or five years as long as his play merits that. And he's done nothing but play well at every level. And to me, like he's earned the opportunity if one becomes available to take that starter role. And, you know, with how his play has been this year, you're kind of getting more and more reticent to, say, trade him off because, you know, like if they, say, move him to a team like L.A. or something like that, you know, he could become a very good goaltender if he has a great team in front of him as well. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, luckily the Flames don't necessarily have to make that decision now. They do have Dan Vladar tied up this year and next year in their contract. For those that don't know, the backup goaltender, the e-bug as they call him, the emergency backup goaltender for this one's name was Dusty Nickel. Dusty Nickel's a Mount Royal University Cougars alumni where he spent four seasons with the Cougars and was a four-time CIS All-Canadian Academic Athlete. He's been coaching and developing goaltenders for over 15 years with Apex Goaltending, and obviously now he works as, a, uh, as an e-bug for the Flames as well. So... As much as it would be cool, and we always see those cool stories like in Toronto where the e-bug comes in and saves the day, I'm not confident that would have happened if we had to throw, you know, nickel in as early as we thought we might have here. Yeah, like it, it's really throwing the guy to the wolves, especially if it's against a team like Vegas. And like 
it, it pretty much, like, even if Vladar got hurt in the game, like, as long as Vladar could stand in net, I think that Vladar would have stayed in <laughs> for as long as possible. Um, just because, you know, it's not really fair to Dusty Nickel to be facing, you know, a powerhouse team in the NHL, regardless of, you know, whatever situation. Like, it's just not a good thing. It, for sure. For him. And, you know, the Flames won this one in overtime, but the only time I could see Nickel having been in is the Flames were up like 4-1 with five minutes left. I think you might throw Nickel in just so he can say he played an NHL game. Yeah, I could see that. You know, so, and we've or seen that. Or conversely, if it was like 4-1 for the other team. Yeah, yeah, you could Same do that too. Either way. But, yeah, I think, you know, if the game didn't matter anymore... Um, or not that it didn't matter, but the, you know, there's no way to drastically impact the, you know, the points on the board. I think you might've seen them in there. Yeah. And you know, the other thing I wanted to, to bring up here that I thought, and I don't know how you felt. I thought the flames offense looked a lot more creative in this game than we've seen in the past. Yeah. And I think that getting more time to practice, uh, especially, um, after lengthy road trips uh, has allowed this team, like every time they've had a bit of a break from the road, uh, this team has markedly improved. And like, frankly, the team was dangerous for most of the night and thoroughly outplayed Vegas for a large swaths of the evening. For sure. Yep. And, you know, always good when you can beat the champs, right? Yeah. And it was nice of Mackenzie Weger to have a little fun in overtime. Well, not only was there some fun in overtime there, there was some fun in overtime in the next game. The Calgary Flames and the Dallas Stars went at it on the 30th of November. Again, an overtime win for the Flames, 4-3 over Dallas. Um, this was this was Tanev's first goal of the season, this one. And for the ninth time in 12 games, the Flames picked up at least a point in a game they trailed in while also being their third consecutive overtime win. So, you know, starting to see a lot of change here for the, the Flames and I guess how they're playing. I love the uh, the Kadri overtime goal in this one. What were your thoughts on this go on this game? I I think that the Flames' effort level was what got them the victory, and they just never said die. And even when the Michael Backlund equalizer in the third period was waved off under somewhat iffy circumstances, considering it hit him after it hit his hand, like that should have negated it, but you know. The NHL's rule book is a little bit weird, I guess. I don't know if it's the rule book always or the interpretation of the rule book. That's what I mean. Like it, it cause like I've never seen a play where it hits the player that gloved the puck and then get called for a hand pass, because if it hits your body or the other team, it shouldn't negate it. But anyhow, they managed despite that setback. To find the equalizer a couple minutes after that, when you know a team like this team early in the season or last year, that like that would have been the game. Yeah, I agree. And you know this one, I think a difference from the last time we played Dallas, Scott Wedgwood in that here. I've never thought Wedgwood was you know a great goaltender. I mean, sure, I guess he's a serviceable backup, but you know I'm not. I don't. I think if Ottinger was in net, the Flames probably would not have scored four. No, and. That's where, like, last week I said that, like, if it was me, I would have put Ottinger in that uh, just to get allow him the redemption arc against the, the Flames after we lit him up last time. But uh, good for us that they didn't. And, you know, the thing that impressed me the most was limiting him uh, or the Dallas Stars to only 16 shots in the game. That was impressive for sure. Yeah, and, and I think that says something about the defense, not only defense men, but the sort of the change in the system we've seen. And we've seen these guys, I would say, struggling at times to adapt from a Daryl Sutter system to a Ryan Huska system. And I think this game, it showed that, yeah, they, they're starting to get it. Yeah, and like even in the following game against Vancouver, the effort level was there throughout the contest. And we're starting to see, like in the games last week and the games this week, where, like, it doesn't matter what the score is, the, this team's always in it because they just wear you down. And uh, the coaching staff has been extremely effective in limiting the ice time for players that aren't playing well 
and just rolling with whoever is hot and just keep rolling and rolling and rolling until they actually get a goal and most of the time they do most of the time they do however their uh, their point streak came to an end against vancouver as you mentioned we'll come back to the trade afterwards but we should note here that this is the first game of um nikita zadorov's tenure as a canuck in fact from what i understand he met them here in calgary and I'm glad he didn't score, but he did get the assist on the game winner in his debut as the Flames dropped this one 4-3 in regular time. Matt, while I agree about what you said earlier about the compete level, I didn't think that Markstrom looked as sharp as he usually does in this one. No. Uh, I think that the first goal was an atrociously bad goal, uh, hearkening back to last year's struggles. The where Hughes like, goal? Yeah. Like, he was not in the right positioning at all. And left the into like if he was in the right positioning, that shot would have hit his side and redirected into the corner harmlessly. Uh, but because he was a little bit over to the right of where he should have been, that puck goes right off of him and into the net. And you know, it, an unfortunate play, and frankly, that kind of costs the team in the long run because what should have been a regular routine save ends up being the difference in a one goal game yeah no i think that's fair to say and you know i thought vancouver we saw in this one why i think vancouver is where they are in the standings but i just thought i thought that you know most of the team looked good i thought lindholm looked really good in this one you know the top guys were looking good but it, i think it was markstrom i don't know he just didn't look as sharp and that's gonna happen right every goaltender is gonna have off nights it's a matter of how they bounce back and i'd say it's probably markstrom's first off night this season yeah i I would agree with that and you know it's interesting to look at how differently uh similar the, the vancouver canucks and calgary flames are like each one of these teams has a very strong strength and then a glaring weakness and Vancouver's shooting ability and passing ability, especially on the power play or on odd man rushes, is a thing to behold and will generate a ton of offense for them this season. But their defense and the the defensemen are basically horrible. Edmonton. <laughs> yeah, and that like this is a team where once they get into the playoffs, they're going to be an easy out unless they get two really good shutdown defensemen. And, you know, that's not exactly... One is possible, two is not really. Um, And, like, this team has a glaring weakness on their defense because, like, it's bad. (laughs) They started to fix that. We'll come back to that in just a second. But after this, the Calgary Flames now sit... um, Fourth in the Pacific Division, they played 24 games. That's 10 wins, 11 losses, three overtime losses for a total of 23 points. Right above them in the Pacific Division is LA at 29. But if we take a look at the wild card rankings for the Western Conference, uh, Calgary is sitting third in the wild card race, two points behind the St. Louis Blues, and three points behind the Arizona Coyotes. So they are starting to fight their way back into this. Um, they're .479 now for. Point percentage, so not quite 500, but starting to fight their way back into the into you know playoff contention. Yeah, and realistically, as long as they can keep pace with those teams, and perhaps even surpass them as the month carries on, uh, that is exactly what the team needs. Um, if they start to fall back and falter again, uh, well, we've already discussed. <laughs> in previous episodes what will happen with this team yeah and we can revisit that again in the future if we want to definitely um let's talk let's start talking about the blue line i think there's a lot to talk about there and i think the first thing we have to discuss is the trade calgary flames make their first trade of the season the second trade really under craig conroy as gm the first one being the defoli deal the calgary flames sent defenseman nikita zadorov to the Vancouver Canucks in exchange for a 2024 fifth round pick and a 2026 third round pick. And I've had a lot of discussion with fans this week. I've seen a lot of discussion online of people thinking this was a bad deal. And before I let you chime in with your thoughts, I just want to point out here, I think the thing a lot of people are forgetting is the Flames clear up almost $4 million in cap room in this. Yes, they didn't get a body back, and I think they will have to for, you know, um, Hannafin or Tanev if they move them. 
But I think the the thing people are underestimating is the cap room the Flames are getting back here because it allows them to go out and take another player later. It allows them to do a deal with somebody like Toronto or another team to bring back a bad contract and maybe get paid for doing that. I think that cap flexibility here is, in a lot of ways, the unsung hero for the Flames, whether they're bringing back maybe a player who's on a long-term deal that they want to keep on a long-term deal, whether they act as a broker, and we always see somebody do that around the deadline where they take a deal, eat half of it, and trade it off again, or whether they're going to help somebody at Toronto by taking you know a deal, $4 million or half of a deal or something, and keeping it for this year, next year. It gives them a lot of options, and to me, that's the thing a lot of people fail to see here is the flexibility this gives them cap-wise. And because of that, I think this is a better deal than people are giving it credit for. Yeah, and realistically, like if the Flames were to go full seller mode uh, with the UFAs, like being able to recoup about 15 or so assets in some aspect for the five guys that are likeliest to go between Hannafin, Tanev, Lindholm, Zadorov, and Markstrom, you know, if the Flames were to sell off, they need to get about 15 assets for those uh, players. And, you know, getting two draft picks, like, I know some people complain, like, oh, well, it's a fifth-round pick this year. It's Chicago's fifth-round pick, so it's going to be in the top five of the fifth round. So it's basically a fourth-round draft pick. And the third round pick in 2026, who knows exactly what Vancouver is two years from now. And either way, the Flames have been one of the best drafting teams over the last decade. So, you know, more bullets in the chamber is nothing but a good thing for this team. And yeah, and whether you make the pick or you trade the pick, you know, I think that there's merit either way, but picks become an asset. And yeah. the more of that asset that you have... You know, the more trade capital you have, the better off you are. Exactly. And it's one of those things where, like, the Flames could utilize those draft picks at the draft even uh, or at the trade deadline if there's somebody that they see that they want to take a flyer on uh, for, like, next year and beyond. Or they just make the picks themselves. Any which way, like, you yeah, know, or it tossing team... it in with somebody to sort of sweeten the pot somehow. Yeah, like, it's just a good bit of flexibility for this team to have. And, like, if the Flames are in a rebuild slash retool, the more things that you can play with, the better off you are in order to get that rebuild done quickly instead of taking 10 to 15 years. So... This is kind of an interesting trade. The Van the Vancouver Canucks and the Chicago Blackhawks made a deal on November 28th where the Blackhawks acquired Anthony Bolivier from Vancouver for a 2024 fifth round pick. And the condition is Vancouver will receive the best fifth round pick that Chicago owns. They then traded that pick with those conditions to Calgary for Zadorov. So really, if you look at it, it's um, An Vancouver's traded Anthony Bolivier and a third for Zadorov. Yeah, and realistically, the Flames traded um, Zadorov for those two draft picks and the ability to have Oliver Shillington return. Yeah, exactly. Well, and we'll talk about that a little further, too. And, you know, it, the the cap is a confusing thing. The cap is weird in the way it's calculated. But because the Flames made this deal early, from the way I calculated, is they're actually going to cure more salary room to use the deadline than if they were to have made this deal at the deadline. Yeah, and I think that between the news that Oliver Shillington is uh, in Calgary and now skating with the team, um, you know, like all of these things add up to it being necessary for this team to accrue that cap space sooner and make this trade sooner than later. And... You know, as much as, like, I personally am disappointed that Zadorov's no longer on the team, it's one of those where, circumstantially, it makes the most sense for, you know, you have a player who wants out, and you got two solid draft picks and the ability for Shillington to slot back in the lineup. It's a win-win-win on that So, front. let's talk a little bit, before we move on to the Shillington thing, because that'll be our next topic, but... 
looking at this trade, let's talk about some of the criticisms people have had online. The first one being, why make the pick so far out in 2026? And that was weird to me when I first saw it too. We'd have to talk to Vancouver about why. When I first saw that, I kind of assumed there was some sort of condition where it could move forward. Yeah, it seems like a long way out, but I have a feeling this is really two teams I don't think quite know where they're going to be. So I think Vancouver is trying to kick that ball as far into the future as they can. And you know what? I'm I'm not as worried about that part as I think a lot of people are. Well, and the one problem that I have when uh, teams go into a retool situation is that you sometimes see, see teams where they, they'll have 10, 11, 12, 13 draft picks in a single draft. And frankly, you it out. yeah, it, it, it's hard for teams to be able to devote as much resources to that many players. And seldom does a team get that many draft picks and have more than like one or two guys actually turn into NHLers from that crop. Usually like you kind of do need to space it out where like if you're having say that like eight or nine picks, but every year for like four or five years, you'll probably end up getting the same amount per year, if not a little bit more than if it's everything's overly congested. Yeah, and I think, you know, I mean, I think, and we're, we're talking about the blue line, so I'll put this out there. I think this year the Flames, the, the draft probably need to focus on defensemen, right? But that doesn't mean two years from now they're not going to. When you look ahead as well, they also don't have a first-round pick in 2026. So I think acquiring as many early rounders as you can to try and offset, that's a good idea. But I totally agree with you. Who knows what they'll need two years from now? Whether they need a draft? Let's not just draft a whole ton in 2024 and hope those guys develop bring them in over time and space that out. And also if they, you know, if they need the currency down the road to bring in a player who, you know, who I don't, I don't, I'm not convinced Vancouver is going to be higher than Calgary in the standings two years from now. No. Um, so it might be a more valuable pick. Yeah. And even then it either way, it gives the team's options sort of like the Chicago trade where they have the clause of, well, you get the better of, Whichever pick it is. I'm glad I'm not the guy at the NHL office who has to figure out all these conditions. I know. Uh, well, after last uh, year's uh, debacle with the Monaghan trade and the whole binder that you need for all the clauses. Well, and um, it's the first time I've seen like sub scenarios and like, you know, I'm reading the conditions on it and there's like five different scenarios for this. I think that the NHL needs to hire a D&D uh, DM to, you know... <laughs> Who's used to? I'm just know, wait, I'm, I'm waiting. For, I'm things. waiting for a condition like that, Matt. At the draft table, we will roll a dice. If it's odd, <laughs> you get this year's pick. If it's even, we get that one. If we roll the same number, then we'll pull out some cards and we'll play blackjack. And whoever wins, like you know, yeah. I'm waiting for something goofy like that. If I happen to wear a red shirt at the draft, you get my third. If you wear a blue one, you get my second. If neither of us does, but you know, Gary Bettman shows up with an orange tie, then this happens. Yeah. And I'm sure you, one of their betting roll, partners would happily take bets on that. Yeah, you roll a one, you have to quit your job and get hired by Edmonton. <laughs> there you go. Um, you you have to trade place with Kenny Holland. And then the other no. the other criticism here, and one I think maybe has a little more weight, though I'm not too worried about, is trading in the division. To me, the only team that I think is off limits for trades, even though I know they made some trades in the past, the Oilers. Yes, I don't want them to make a, an interdivision trade, but I think, you know what, it was a good trade, and if the best trade comes interdivision, you got to take it. Yeah, like realistically, looking around the league uh, for places where you would trade a goaltender, like the best of the teams that's available is the Los Angeles Kings. And it's one of those, yeah, they're in our division, and, and <laughs> you know, like even if the Flames made the playoffs – and had to play them so <laughs> like it, it's one of those where you know if you're going to get the best package from a team in our division like yeah you wouldn't want to see him directly going to a rival but you know like even then like frankly a player of Zadorov's caliber isn't going to make all that much difference no and it's sort of like the Steve Steos trade uh for Schmid um, where it's like, okay, third pairing defenseman for third pairing defenseman. 
who cares? Yeah. You know, like, and I, yeah, I, it, I would it, feel much more differently about trading in the division if I thought the Flames were going to go on a run. But you and I talked about it last week. I think even if they can this year, I think the best thing to do is sell the assets, maybe sacrifice this year. I think, you know what, I'm willing to trade them to Vancouver. The deal's up at the end of the year. It doesn't mean he's going to be with Vancouver forever in a day. I'm willing to give Vancouver, you know, a short-term boost for a long-term gain for Calgary because yeah, I don't think it's going to affect them either way. Realistically, if you look at the market for players, like, frankly, Calgary is still going to be one of the better places for him to play next year, providing he is a UFA at that point. So, you know, it's one of those where... You think we could do an Ole Jokinen where he comes, he, he gets traded, and he comes back? Yeah, like, of all of the UFAs that the Flames have, I think that one would make the most sense because, like, if the Flames, say, have to trade Hannafin and Tanev later on in the season, the roster spot would be available for him to get that expanded role that he's looking for. For those that don't know, the Flames acquired Ole Jokin and he played here. Uh, they traded him away, I think, the next year at the deadline, and then he was a free agent. And they brought him back as a free agent, and it kind of shocked everybody. So it, it, look it up online, but that's what we mean when we the, talk about the him. The pancakes were just too good. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I, at first, I thought like maybe he couldn't sell his house or something, so he just came back. But look it, look it up online if you're not sure. It was it was a weird scenario. Well, you see, the Stampede breakfasts, they, they just have that mesmerizing effect. <laughs> but you can come in for a week and leave. You don't need to stay here. Yeah, and <laughs> we don't have pancakes where I come from in Finland. <laughs> what is this land of pancakes? <laughs> That's right. Um, anyway, just an interesting note here from Elliot Friedman, and I'll read this. You can read the entire tweet on his Twitter, uh, um, and I think it was also in 32 Thoughts. It was posted as multiple tweets and also in 32 Thoughts. Um, now, the two teams involved here wouldn't discuss it, but there was an attempt by the Toronto Maple Leafs to get both Tanev and Zadora from Calgary. From what I understand is the issue was that the Maple Leafs and the Flames could not agree on what it would cost for Calgary to keep up to 50% of the salary on both players because Toronto's only got $1.5 million, I think, that they can use. Going back to the quote, I don't know what the exact percentage was Toronto asked, but if it was up to half and the two sides couldn't figure that out that compensation, in addition to just the compensation for the players. So as a result, 10 of his Zadorov to Toronto didn't happen. Zadorov goes to the Canucks. The Maple Leafs do continue to look for defensemen out there. I do think they will continue to pursue Chris Tanev, although because Tanev makes a larger salary than Zadorov, it might take longer for Tanev, for the Tanev move to happen, whether to Toronto or somewhere else. So I just thought I'd throw that in there, Matt, because, I mean, you know, like him or not, Friedman tends to have good sources, and I thought that was kind of interesting to know that maybe there was a blockbuster being done with uh, with Toronto for two, two defensemen. Yeah, and realistically... Um... You know, not to slight Zadorov too much, but, you know, like the bulk of the return for uh, that trade would be going for whatever Chris Tanev's for worth, sure. not, uh, you know. Uh, um, so realistically, I'm sure that the Flames, like if they're, they are moving in that direction to trade Tanev to the Leafs, that it, realistically the talks are not going to break down over that and it would be more of a, okay, we have to tweak it slightly to make the numbers work. Here's how we'll do it. And In, Yeah, and you know, the the other thing I think not enough people are talking about is we really don't know what the market is for any of these guys at the Flames near trade, right? The market is always dictated by other deals. Well, I think even though, even if you think the Flames may be sold low on Zadorov, which I don't and Matt doesn't, but let's just say that you do, the Flames have now set the market price, right? If the price for Zadorov is a fifth and a third, it's going to cost you at least a second for Tanev. So, you know, I yeah, think it's and probably two seconds for Tanev. Frankly. Yeah. Or a roster player. Like I don't think the Tanev and if Hannafin moves, get shipped out just for picks. But I think, you know, we've now set the price, right? We've said, this is what the five, six defenseman costs. If you want the, you know, four and higher, it's going to cost more. So I think in some ways yeah, the flames set their own prices. Yeah. And realistically, you know, the, the defensive defenseman warrior type like Tanev, like in the past has gotten a late first round draft pick from whichever team acquires him. So uh, realistically, the Flames could likely get a pick in that 25 to 30 range, uh, give or take. Um, 
I think it would just largely depend on uh, the exact details of what you're getting, whether it's draft picks and or prospects, but about that value overall. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And a name that you mentioned earlier, let's go there now. So the Flames, obviously, without a defenseman, um, the Flames already maybe have a thin defensive core, and it had to be like a day, maybe two after the uh, the deal was, was announced with Zadorov. It was announced that Oliver Shillington is skating again, and not just skating anywhere. He was on Max Bell Ice, and I believe he's now had one skate with the Calgary Flames. We have no timeline imminent for him to return, but interesting, as you're mentioning the timing, that it's like, okay, one guy's back on the ice, we say goodbye to the other guy. That would really fill a hole for the Flames. Yeah, and realistically, I would expect it to take probably three weeks for him to get up to uh, NHL caliber speed wise, and then, uh, you know, a conditioning stint in I Stockton. was just about to say that. Or I don't think you can put a guy. Wranglers. I don't think that you can put a guy who hasn't played in a season and a quarter right on the NHL and expect anything, you know, good from them. I think, and I was trying to read the exact CBA rules, and it's kind of fuzzy because Tanev's not really on LTIR, but I would expect that they they utilize if the league lets them, which I think they would, the two-week conditioning stint rule, and he, he plays two weeks for the Wranglers. Yeah, I would assume that would be the case just because of the fact that, like, he literally has not played in a year and a half, and... You know, it's only fair to the Flames to get him some actual game action before having to slot him in. Could he play at the NHL level and be sheltered as the number six for a few games? Sure. But it's not doing him or the Flames a solid on that front. And, you know, I think if he can get a couple weeks worth of games in, playing four or five games with the Wranglers, I think that would be enough for him to get back up to speed full time. And then probably in the NHL, he'd probably struggle for the first couple of weeks until he fully got back up to NHL game pace and then be fine from that point on. Yeah, but I, I totally expect there to be an AHL conditioning stint here. And to me, I think the best time maybe to do that, if you're going to do it, is the end of this month, early January. I was kind of looking at this. I'm thinking, okay, if you want to take advantage of when to put him in the AHL, if, if you look at a two-week period, and I won't go into the Wranglers' exact schedule, everybody can look at it, but let's say it takes two, two and a half weeks for him to be ready, which I would assume is a fairly you know reasonable timeline. The Flames or the Wranglers between the 20th and the 29th play five games. Obviously, there's a bit of a Christmas break in there. And then the first week of January, they play four games in six, six nights. So that could be a great week to put them down there as well. And those are all, it looks like, home games. So not a lot of travel, not a lot of, you know, stuff to get back up. And then there's a four-game or a four-day break and two more. So I'm expecting here, if you're trying to maximize your return on a conditioning stint, I'm kind of expecting he goes down right after Christmas, let's say the 28th, and he's, and then he plays almost six games down there. Yeah, that, that makes Just, the most you know, sense. If, if and you're going to send him down, you want to make sure he's playing games. Yeah, and then realistically calling him up after that point, the month of January's schedule is fairly weak for our opponents. Like, we're playing a lot of bad teams, which, it, frankly, if you're going to ease a guy back into the NHL, you would want them him facing the likes of those teams instead of teams like Colorado, Dallas, Vegas, Vancouver right off the hop for sure. And, you know, I think that you can easily replace, let's be honest. Zadorov was a five, six guy here. You know, yes, they tried him as a three, four. I don't think he ever really worked all that well there. He made mistakes. I think he could have been if the team was rebuilding, but I think if we look at the top four, not moving anywhere, Uyghur, Anderson, Hannafin, Tanev for a little bit, I think it's easy to just, you know, drop Shillington onto the five, six, the third pairing. And even, I mean, N not see a lot of change there or, you know, not see a lot of him declining or having to get back up to speed. If we were asking him to play a top four role, I think we'd be disappointed, but I think we could put him onto five, six after a short AHL stint and, and not see a lot of degradation in, in that roster spot, if that makes sense. Yeah. And realistically, like if he plays very poorly on, upon his return, 
the Flames would still have options, whether it's Sloviev, Gilbert, Osterly, um, De Simone. Like, there are plenty of guys available uh, to play the five, six minutes if Shillington uh, isn't cutting it. But I think that, like, especially with Shillington's contract being at the end of the year, uh, it's over and he's an unrestricted free agent. I think this is a good time for him to get back in, play a half of a season, show his value. So that way the Flames, like, he can sign, like, a one-year deal with us for next year probably in like the million to million and a half zone to like okay you're back for next year you you start the year from zero and yeah. we'll give you whatever contract after that well and i mean to me we still don't know what shillington is i mean for years you and i said this guy looked terrible on the blue line let's move him let's move on from him and then he really had one good year that got him you know a two and a half million yeah. dollar contract i know and he looked like a top four defenseman with possible top pairing potential and then so which version of him do we get when he comes back is yet to be yeah. seen and i think that like even if you're retooling the less good version of shillington is still a viable third pairing guy uh for next season um and like you could have him back as like the one and a half million dollar third pairing guy and be perfectly serviceable to see you know, like give him a full audition to see if he's worthy of a three, four, five, six, seven yeah. year contract after that point. Uh, but, you know, I think it's a mutual and I mean, that's beneficial. Up to him too. I mean, he may decide he wants to go back to Sweden. Yeah. And that also depends on his performance level, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Like if I he bombs just to say, like to take the negative, you know, then like there's not realistically going to be many teams knocking at the door to give him that shot. So he probably would go back to Europe to try to reestablish some value or just, you know, be very good in the Swedish elite league. And we don't know what's going on with him either. I mean, you know, he might just need to be back home, right? He might even just say, Hey, I don't want another NHL deal. I need to go back home. Yep. And any which permutation, I think uh, the Flames and Shillington respect each other enough to give deference to the other side and be forthright with whatever um, their needs are and desires are with each other's situation. I'm not looking at this as, wow, Shillington's coming back. They're getting a, you know, a top four defenseman. I think, you know what, he's going to be, he's going to look better than Osterley and Gilbert, who are kind of in that, you know, or around the same Six, level seven, as Osterley yeah. and Gilbert, who are there now. So, you know, and if he doesn't, I mean, let's be honest. He hasn't played in a season and a quarter. I think if you say, you know what, he's not good enough, he's not even good enough to be our seven, or we just want him to play more game minutes, you could put him on waivers and nobody's touching him. Oh, yeah, no. Like, if he comes in and bombs, like, nobody's touching a $2.5 million player that can't make a team that's in the rebuild. Well, that's it. And even if he doesn't bomb, but they say, hey, he needs to play more, and we don't want him as number seven, you drop him on, you know, waivers, he goes down. They can always bring him up later, but I, I think you honestly might see that happen at the beginning is just send him down for some of that flexibility. Nobody's going to touch him. And No, for $2.5 million, like, that player will go to the farm. Yeah, and, you know, because nobody else knows what he is either. Nobody wants to take a chance because what a lot of fans don't know is if you bring a guy up off off waivers, he has to stay on your NHL roster. So somebody else can't take him and then put him in the AHL. And I don't think there's I don't think that there's another team that's confident enough to make him their top seven after seeing him in, what, maybe two games? Yeah, no, and realistically, like, the only way that a team could get that player to the minors is is if uh, they want to assign him, then they have to put him on waivers themselves, and the team that well, lost them, that, yeah, then they have to option him the back first to right of, Yeah, has the first right of refusal. So you know, and realistically, if that's the case, I think the Flames would just take him back. I agree. Yeah, the only guy who can maybe see taking a run at him is Tree Living. Um, but even then, at two point five, Tree doesn't have the money. He doesn't even have the money to bury him, so no. he wouldn't do that. But yeah, I mean, I think this could be a good thing. But I'm very cautious and optimistic about what Shillington is, and I honestly don't think, even if he's ready, we see him in a Calgary Flames jersey until the new year. Yeah, I think it would be rushed if it was any of the games before then. Yeah, I think we might see him playing professional hockey, but I don't think we'll see him in a Calgary Flames jersey. Yeah, I agree. Uh, um, and then. 
Let's talk about another roster move on the back end. The Flames obviously now short a defenseman. Their 5-6 pairing, I guess, at this point has been Gilbert Osterley. Osterley got recalled after being sent down to the HL. This was my worry. Is you know what? It feels like the Flames now have four defensemen and two spare parts. They finally made a call-up. Ilya Soloviev has come back. We saw him play two games here earlier in the season. Um, Matt, I think this is probably a permanent call-up at this point. As permanent as Zari or Pospisil are, unless he plays himself out of a job. I think, as we've heard Conroy say a number of times, they're trying to make room for young guys. Soloviev's the only, I think, young guy on the farm that you know they can bring up because Poirier's hurt. That makes sense to bring up. So I think yeah, their and plan like Kuznetsov is, is the only other young defenseman in the A. And realistically, he still needs some aid time. Yeah, he needs to be a top pairing defenseman in the A first before getting a call up. Yeah, so I don't know if it'll be Gilbert. My guess is for now it's going to be Gilbert and Soloviev. Maybe eventually it'll be Shillington Soloviev, but. I have a feeling that uh, Soloviev's probably here to stay unless he plays himself out of a job. Yep. And, you L- know, I lose one very tall Russian player, get another very tall Russian player. There you go. The Twin Towers. Yep. Belarusian, um, pardon me. That's right. Yep. We, uh, he's big. He wears red. I don't know. Maybe we should call him Big Red. That could be his new that, name. That, that's a little on the nose. <laughs> or, you know, Solo Cuffs are red. Maybe we can call him Solo. Who knows? Um, I don't expect Soloviev to move any higher than the top four at this point. I mean, yes, if Tanev or Hannafin gets moved, I think he could. But I think you're bringing this guy in right now to play in your bottom pair, unless he really wows you and you bring him up. But I think it's just, let's see if he can do it consistently at the NHL level before we put more responsibility on him. Yeah, frankly, it's auditioning for a job for next year. And... Uh, you know, and you're seeing that with a bunch of the Flames' younger guys like Pospisil, et cetera, that, um, you know, like, if you play well and have a really good season, you know, you're going to be first in line next year to have that fourth-line roster spot or above. And, you know, like we've seen with Walker Dewar, him regressing significantly after being so good last year, um, you know, not everything is set in stone, but... Yeah, and, I, uh, and I think they want to give Soloviev enough time to figure out what exactly he is. what he is. Yeah, yeah. And the more the better. And you know, it, frankly, the timing of the trade between Shillington getting ready to come back and all of the other particulars it makes a very good uh, set scenario for this team uh, moving forward. So that way they can both be respectful of the better players on the team to keep going for wins and to try and make the playoffs while also fostering the rebuild retool and allow the young guys to have some youthful enthusiasm to help the team as well. And Soloviev is waiver exempt, so he can come up and down as much as the Flames want him to. He's also, and I think this plays into a little bit too, he's a 23-year-old restricted free agent. I think by at least giving him a shot, you're probably going to retain him next year. Yeah, and it's looking ahead to next year where, like, say the Flames have to trade off Hannafin and Tanev, and they don't really get too many guys in return for the blue line. Like, you're looking at a blue line of potentially Anderson, Uyghur, Shillington, and then, you know, fill in the blanks here. and. You know, like, there's not really a ton of anything that's cemented in after those three. And, you know, having a guy like Soloviev, if he uh, equates himself well at this level, then you've got a good inkling that one of those three spots will be his to start next year. And, you know, try to put more effort into figuring out the other two spots, whether it's through trade or free agency. For sure. And with, obviously, uh, Soloviev coming up to the Flames, and again, it looking like maybe a, a longer-term thing, that leaves the Wranglers short of defensemen. So the Flames had to find a way to solve that, and they did. They made a free agent signing, which is a weird thing to say at the on the 3rd of December that the Flames made a UFA signing. Um, well, for- you know, it's July, you know Christmas in July or you know summer in December. I, I don't know. There you but. go. <laughs> um, they brought in 31-year-old 
uh, defenseman Mark Pesic, and that is how it's said on the NHL media site. I know there's been some debate over how to say his name. He's a six foot one, 198 pound uh, defenseman from Sherwood Park, Alberta. Some interesting notes on him in an interview he did with Pat Steinberg. He grew up in the Edmonton area, but grew up as more of a Flames fan thanks to Jerome McGinley. He's coming back from two Achilles injuries and a broken foot over the last 18 months. And he knows he's likely to start in the HL, which now we know he will. He's been assigned to the Wranglers, um, but sees opportunity here. He last played 2021-2022 um, in the NHL for Buffalo, 68 games. He did play eight games earlier this year for the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins. Um, there's a weird HL rule. You can bring a guy in on a tryout and they're eligible to play, unlike in the NHL. So he played eight games there. But he's, I mean, he, in a lot of ways, he's, he reminds me of Shillington, right? A guy who hasn't played in a while, coming back, we don't know what he is. But I like the fact they're going with a 31-year-old sort of proven guy who has a lot of NHL experience behind him. You know, he's played 70-game seasons, 82-game seasons, instead of going out and getting, you know, a, a 19-year-old college guy who you're not sure what you're going to get. Well, especially with the Wranglers being the best team in the AHL, the you know, you want to have some continuity in terms of the players that you're deploying down there. And with the Flames having to recall Soloviev and having uh, Osterley and, uh, you know, or Gilbert or De Simone in the NHL roster as well, like it, it creates a bit of a problem because you're basically eating the Wranglers defense core a bit by bit. And Having a guy like Pesic, who's a local boy, uh, be down there, and he's hungry to remain uh, an NHL player, and you know he has been through a lot of injuries, and he he might not necessarily be an NHL caliber player anymore, but he has a long legacy of being an NHLer, so you know, especially like if the Flames do have to later on in the season move off a couple of players you might see him being recalled uh closer to the trade deadline to fill that like five six spot we've talked about this the angel level too about you know a lot of times when teams are going deep they want to bring in veterans who know how to win and i see this very similar for the wranglers right we're bringing in a guy who has played in ahl playoffs i mean he you know played for uh, rochester for a couple of years in the playoffs he went he played four games with the Florida Panthers in the NHL in 2019-2020. Like, this is a guy who knows how to be a pro. And I think putting more veterans on the Wranglers team, if you're not taking away a young guy and his opportunity, I think is a great idea. Because I think, you know, if you can have a guy who can say to these players, I know what it takes to get to the NHL. I've been there. Not just for a cup of coffee. He's played, you know, as a pretty regular NHLer since about, you know, 2014-2015. I think, you know, those those guys are always going to help your room. Oh, for sure. And, like, that's part of, like, hearkening back to an earlier conversation about uh, draft picks and, you know, like, the emphasis on skill. Because, like, even if they're not necessarily, you know, making the NHL, they're competent enough to help the other guys on their team better uh, be able to develop because they can make and receive passes effectively. And... You know, that's part of the reason why the Flames have been such a good developmental team. And having a good veteran who knows what to do and what to do in certain situations will help to teach guys like Kuznetsov, like Soloviev, like Poirier on what it takes to be a good defensive defenseman in the NHL. And, you know, like it's not an easy job. And, you know, he played and not rather just teaching effectively. them what it takes, but I think teaching them perseverance too that hey i was in the nhl level i had an injury i'm starting back at the hl level like hl level like you are to work my way up instead of you know going over to europe or something i think it shows dedication there too and those are the kind of guys you want in your organization and you want to show that to some of those young guys too that you know what my career i had some issues but i'm willing to put in the work just like you are yep and i would not be surprised if we see him in the flames jersey later on in this year yeah, I wouldn't either. And I, I could see him and Osterley kind of moving back and forth in that number seven spot. Yep. So if you're a Wranglers fan, uh, Pesic will be wearing 13. Matt, I thought it'd be interesting quickly here just to go through the names that are currently on the Wranglers blue line and see how many of these names we actually know. We have number five, Colton Pullman. 
Number 13, Mark Pesek. Number 16, Will Riddell. Number 27, Nick D. Simone. Number 33, Brady Lyle. Number 37, Jan Kuznetsov. 42, Sam Jardine. 48, Jonathan Asperio. And 16, Jared Gorley. I know five like, of them. I think so we're, we're I... familiar with... Yeah, like we know Pullman, we know Kuznetsov, we know Simone, we know Pisk. That's about it. Yeah. I knew Asperot too. That was the other guy. Okay. Like so, it's yeah. you know it, it's it's very much a lacking defensive defensive core and I would not be surprised honestly if you see the Flames make at least one more signing of the same ilk for their blue line down there. Yeah, or you could see like a prospect for prospect trade where like a dead end prospect uh, gets traded up front for a defensive guy. Um, yeah, sort of and like uh, the, when the flames. Even if the quote unquote uh, flames don't make the signing, you could see I could see the Wranglers making a signing or a trade with one of their own assets too. Yeah, it's sort of like when the Flames traded uh, Klimchuk to the Leafs for that defenseman guy that they got back. Uh, neither one of them panned out for their team, but no. it was just a positional prospect change at that point. Yeah, and, and there's there's AHL deals done all the time too. Not everybody down there's on an AHL contract, so there's AHL deals done all the time too. Um, another another thing on the blue line here I wanted to talk about, and we try not to talk about a lot of rumors, but you know we talked about Friedman, and we're about to look at a story from LeBron at TSN. I think these are guys that are you know well respected. Um, LeBron reports that Hannafin and the Flames were close on an eight year, roughly sixty million dollar deal, which would have carried around an average value of seven point five million. LeBron reported a $60 million total on November 14th, noting that Hannafin decided he wanted to see the Flames' direction as the team struggled early on, and as a result, Calgary pulled the offer. I still expect, for example, Hannafin to get dealt at some point, LeBron said on SportsCenter with Jay Onright. In his case, the idea from everyone involved is that he gets dealt as a signed player. That's that there's an extension in place for wherever he ends up. So LeBron is thinking that we would probably end up seeing Hannafin uh, in a sign-in trade of some kind, but let's just talk about this value here. If you were to have had the Flames sign him to an eight-year deal, $7.5 million a year, what do you think of that for Hannafin? Perfect. N- no complaints. Would have been happy. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that that would have been fine. You know, maybe a little more than I wanted, but considering we're paying Uyghur five point, you know, six point two five, I think seven for for Hannafin with the cap going up next year. I mean, let's call him. Let's say he's making five now, right? He's making four point nine five. Let's round up to five. A two point five million dollar raise for Hannafin seems perfectly fine, and he's twenty six. So while we've been, you know, signing a lot of older guys to long term deals. Um, that's really not going to make him that old. At the end, he's going to be 34. Like, this is not a, you know, a cadre deal here. So that would have left, locked him up in Calgary extensively for the rest of his career. Yeah, and I would still be very thrilled if, frankly, if Hannafin signs that contract. Um, I, and frankly, like, I can understand why he would want to wait and see. Because, uh, like, the Flames were a tire fire. <laughs> Uh, early in the season, but like now that they're, you know, actually playing effectively, you know, I'm, I would not be surprised if the team and the player rekindled their, uh, conversations, especially like if the flames are say in a playoff spot at Christmas, like I could see the team and him hammering a deal out near or around Christmas and maybe signing it uh, at around new year's give or take and even then i could see if he doesn't want to do eight eight you know eight years here but maybe he ends up signing a two or three or four year deal yeah and that's also a possibility you know like i i can see where he might not want to commit let's call the rest of his career in calgary at this point not knowing even if they're in a playoff spot the fact that they usually make the playoffs and don't get any further i can understand if he doesn't want to commit here long term but i I, I'm with you. I don't think it's a bad deal, I, but I could see them. I can't see them going much higher on money, but I could see them maybe changing the years a little bit. Yeah. And realistically, like, uh, you know, like the worst case scenario with Hannafin is that you're going to trade him for a first and two second round draft picks or equivalent level players. Say, yeah. Putting assets so, like, on you're, there, equivalent assets. You know, so like you're going to be getting very good things in return for Noah Hannafin. And it probably will be a, like a late first plus a former first round draft pick player. 
um, that's actually doing incredibly well. Um, yeah, and it's one of those where either you have the player, which if that's the case, great, because then the Flames have a, a top three that's the envy of the league. Uh, but, you know, if not, then you're going to be getting a bunch of very high quality assets to replace Hannafin internally or um, through the draft or being able to move those parts to replace Hannafin, one or one of those permutations. Exactly, yeah, and, you know, as a Flames fan, I'm torn on which way to go, and part of me says move the asset, you know, get the get assets for him and move forward. This is the time when you've got all these assets to move. Part of me says, you know what, if he wants to stay, lock him up. I, I'm I'm not quite sure which, which uh, direction I'm For I me, uh, six-foot-five defensemen that are actually good um are hard to come by and even if he is like the modern version of jay bomeister that is a, an extremely important piece to your team even if he's only destined to be like the number three defenseman on like a better playoff team like that that's a player that's instrumental for your team and you know seven and a half for that player like that's right on value it's not too much yeah i don't think you can go any higher with the money yeah like even if it was like seven seven five that would be fine eight is pushing it a little high but you know seven and a half that's fine and you know like this team needs to have core pieces and like hannafin could be you know like especially like with the team having guys like poirier coming up that you know you're you have options and you know, you want to have a good base so that way, like, the guys like Poirier and Shillington and that have room to develop without having to be thrown to the wolves. Yeah, and, you know, I'm we forget how young Hannafin is because he's been playing in the league forever. Like, he's 26 right now. So even if they sign him to an eight-year deal, he doesn't play a really, you know, rugged game where he's going to get a lot of wear on him. He's nowhere near Chris Tanev. I think even if they signed him and things went south, that's a contract you could probably move at 30. Oh, yeah, easily. Like, at any point, if you wanted to trade him, you could. Like, and, like, if you wanted to, say, pull it as a door off, like, two years from now, say the Flames tank at that point and, like, everything just falls apart, like, you could still get the first and two seconds caliber players for him like you know like the defensemen like him do not come by easily and like even the flames when they traded bowmeister like he was a free agent to be they got a first and two middling prospects where you know if he had been uh under contract that the flames probably would have had more uh of a return from bowmeister but you know like it, it's a good possibility one way or the other. Yeah. I I think, you know, you can go either way with it. I think either one's fine. You were talking about the Bowmeister deal, just for those that uh, don't remember Calgary shipped Jay Bowmeister to the blues in exchange. They got Mark Kandari, Red O'Bara and a 2020, uh, 2013 first round pick, which turned into Emile Poirier. So a bunch of nothing. Well, they did get a second round pick for Red O'Bara and, you know, they and we got some sweet broke, ninja moves from him, too. Yeah, and then that turned into Hunter Smith because uh, Berkey's not good at drafting. Um, <laughs> so a whole lot more or nothing. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. You know, and, this, and, and that's the only reason. Like, I, I think, yeah, he's young. I think you can definitely keep him around there. I guess right now he already has a modified no movement, and I think the key there is just going to be to make sure if you do sign him long term, he's not getting full no move because I think that gives the team – a little bit more flexibility on him. But I totally don't fault him or the team for pulling that offer. No, it, it's just one of those where, like, at, when the Flames started 2-7-1, and one, like, it basically, like, you and I had that show where it's like, okay, well, we're rebuilding now because uh, this team's What's garbage. that going to take, yeah. You know, and, you know, like, everybody was kind of in that, well, this sucks, <laughs> and... You know, and it, much like the Flames offseason where everybody was disjointed, like the team itself has kind of settled into itself. And with the young guys coming up, uh, it's given a, a re emergence of this team 
and a youthful enthusiasm that they've been lacking. And, you know, like, I can see that changing a lot of minds on amongst the UFAs where, hey, you know, this team might actually be a decent team to play with for the long term. And, you know, just have to wait and see, basically. I totally agree with you. Matt, I think that pretty much sums up our look at the defense for this week. How about you? Yep. Um, we are, I can't believe it. This is coming up quick. We're about 10 days away from our big holiday fan meetup that we've been promoting for a couple of weeks at Bow River Brewing's Tap Room. I don't know about you. I can't think of many things that go better with hockey than beer and pizza. So our friends over at Bow River Brewing have teamed up with us to bring us in on December 14th. It's not going to be a live show. It's going to be a meetup. Matt and I are going to be there. We'll hang out. We'd love to meet all of you. They're going to give us uh, some really good deals while the Flames game's on. The Flames play the Wild that night. So there's going to be a chance to hang out, watch hockey, talk hockey, all of us. Uh, they're going to do $13 for their pizzas, which are usually $17, and $1 off any of their beers, which means a 16-ounce pint is only going to be 6 bucks if you come out. We'd love to have you come out, hang out with us that night, meet us. Matt and I will be there. We'd love to say hi to you. And let's just talk hockey. I mean, you know, we we like to talk hockey too. And honestly, Matt, I've talked hockey with you for 12 years. I know your perspective on the team. Not that it's right or wrong, but I want to hear somebody else's perspective for a little bit. Yeah, I know. I get tired of me too. <laughs> you probably get tired of me. So why don't you guys come out? Let Matt and I know. Are we right or are we wrong? Do we agree with us? Maybe you guys think you could, you're a better host for the show. Come on out, hang out, have a beer, have some pizza, and uh, let, let's chat. You can find more information at firesidechat.ca slash meetup2023. If you go to our website, firesidechat.ca, you'll see the link in the navigation at the top. Or you can find the link in the show notes this week. So put that on your calendar, 6 o'clock, December 14th at Bow River Brewing's Tap Room. And again, the address is on our website. And we'd love to see you there. Matt, let's get into predictions for last week and then looking ahead. You were close with the the right number of wins, but the wrong teams. The Flames beat Vegas-Dallas, lost to Vancouver. You thought they'd beat Dallas-Vancouver, lose to Vegas. And I pulled a Matt, and I was pessimistic and thought they'd only beat Vancouver. Yeah, so you were so, completely wrong. <laughs> you were partially wrong. Yes. Um, let's look ahead at this week. The Flames have three more games, finishing up the last of their six-game homestand. They don't play again until Tuesday, Tuesday night, 7 p.m. They're playing the Minnesota Wild at home in the Dome. That's a 7 p.m. start time. Thursday is 7 p.m. start time when the Carolina Hurricanes come to visit. And then Saturday at 2 p.m. start time, a matinee game as the New Jersey Wild are in town. You want to go first, Matt? I will say that they're going to win all three games. Really? Yeah. Interesting. I uh, like the the fact that they the effort level that this team's had, and they've had more practice time, and I I just feel like th this is a team that they're doing all the fundamentals right, and now they're starting to get better approaches on their power play. Um, they're generating a lot more chances on their power play. There's a lot more urgency on the power play. And it's one of those where, like, they're doing more of the right things, but things still aren't clicking 100%. And I, th I feel that they're going to carry that over and, like, things will actually start. Like, I would not be surprised if there's a game where they have multiple power play goals this week. I, I just, it, it feels like they're starting to put all the things together. Where do you think you see Vladar, if at all? Uh, probably the Carolina game or the New Jersey game. Uh, probably the New Jersey game, actually, because of being a matinee. 2 p.m. start time, let uh, Markstrom sleep in a little bit? Yeah, pretty much. Um, you don't want to get Markstrom's timing off, and those matinee games are a little bit difficult because and then after the matinee time. game you have a day off and then you're in uh colorado on a road trip where it's colorado vegas back to back so yeah i can totally see resting markstrom there and then put him in in colorado on the road in the first of the back to back I, i'd probably do the same yeah i could also see them maybe going to ladar in minnesota yeah i could see that too you know and i could i could see this being the week potentially where you see ladar in two of three like with him looking as good as he has, I think there's going to be some week where the flames are going to give him more starts than Markstrom. And based on what we've seen, this might be the week. 
Yeah, that very well could be. Especially and considering, as I mentioned at the top, I don't think that uh, Marstrom looked all that great in Vancouver. No, and realistically, um, you're also going to want uh, to give Mark or Vladar more of a leash. And having him, like the Flames are playing two Eastern teams this week. And as much as it would suck to lose against any of the teams, it hurts you a can lot afford less. It. Yeah, it hurts a lot less against sure. the East. Yeah, and and Minnesota as a team that's slumping a little bit. I, that's why I think you might see that are there. I'm gonna. I was originally gonna say all three, but when I look at this, I'm gonna say the Flames beat Minnesota, New Jersey, and I think they'll lose to Carolina. Okay. I think Carolina is a tough team. They're they've been a tough team for a while. Um, I I can see the Flames maybe struggling a little bit with them. Yeah, I agree. So that, we'll, we'll, it, that, we'll it, that was the tough game, but. Uh, you know, they've been giant killers thus far this past couple weeks, so we'll see how they handle some very good teams coming up this week. And as you mentioned, I think their special teams is going to be the difference this week. Either it gets going, or I think it could start to sink these guys. Yeah, well, realistically, you can't go much worse than I think they're 27th right now. Yeah. Um, And it's sort of like Andrew Majapane in the last game against Vancouver. Like, he was doing all the right things, by being in the right places and then like everything was just not clicking for him in that game and yet you know and like where like pucks were hopping on him passes went slightly awry but he yet he was in all the right places doing all the right things and eventually if you keep that up those bounces start going your way and you know, like with him specifically, I would not be surprised if he goes on a bit of a hot streak because he's been looking a lot better of late as well. And I think the power play, like there's, they're seeming to be getting it more now, especially with the added practice time. So with the them having two days off between the last game and the next one, I, I feel that that's going to improve significantly. And I feel like we're getting to the point in the season where if they're going to continue to struggle on the power play, it's really going to start affecting them. Like they need to either figure this out or they're going to fall in the standings. I agree. I think they've, you know, artificially propped themselves up as much as they can. I think that Vancouver game, they could have won if they could have scored on the power play. Oh, I agree. And it's one of those where the effort level can only carry you so far. And, you know, like, yeah, they're a very hardworking team and they've scored a number of goals which have been of the dirty, grinded out in front of the net type goals. And, it, you know, it's one of those where you need some talent to back it up and hopefully that starts shining through because this team is good when they're on. Exactly. Well, Matt, I think that wraps things up for this week. Um We'll see how things go and what happens in the blue line and how good Soloviev looks this week. And uh, we will report back next week on if we know anything more with Shillington and just how this team does and if they can put things together. Yep. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.